This is the beginning of part two of the May 2020 Ask Me Anything for Mindscape. If you haven't seen part one, it's in another post up there on Patreon. The file was too big to fit in one file. Ben Resnick says, Assuming many worlds in the time symmetry of the laws of physics, isn't it always a possibility that a world could evolve to its previous state, and given that all worlds that could exist do exist, that there will always be a world which appears to evolve backwards in time in comparison with our own world, or any particular world for that matter? Uh, yeah, sure, that's possible, as long as it doesn't violate conservation laws and other basic features, but those, ru those worlds are really, 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 really tiny in the wave function, so I do not lose sleep over them. Paul Hardy says, I've heard it said that the Big Bang was the beginning of time, but also our universe might be part of a multiverse or a pocket universe or arose from something earlier. So wouldn't time have had to exist for that earlier thing to be around? Uh, yes. So these are two different ideas. We don't know whether the Big Bang was the beginning of time. It might have been. There is a a habit in some pop science circles of taking classical general relativity, which implies that the beginning of the universe was a big bang that had a singularity, etc., and implying that that means that the real universe had a beginning. In fact, scientists don't know whether the real universe had a beginning because there's such a thing as quantum mechanics, and classical general relativity can't be white. Right. So there's various ways, various physical mechanisms, which you could get a universe before the Big Bang, and we don't know whether those models are true or not. So either the Big Bang was the beginning, or it came out of something else and time pre-existed it. We're just not sure. Krabby Smale says, two months back you took issue with correlating how low correlating low physical entropy with low algorithmic information content. Do you see no positive relation even when distinguishing between microstates? The relationship I was trying to draw was between compressibility of micro descriptions and entropy. Low entropy macrostates more tightly constrain and thus provide more information about the possible microstates. The unusual high entropy microstates compatible with evolution to a medium entropy present require stating in detail at high information cost to a model. However, we can effectively specify compatible microstates that happen to be low entropy simply by giving the macrostates. So again, I'm, I'm just not really quite understanding the, the positive statement being made here. Uh, I mean, maybe there is some like short actual substantive claim that I could that could evaluate. So let me say things that I think are true. Um, a macro state that has low entropy tells you a lot of information about the micro state that is in it. But there are other ways to tell yourself a lot of information about the microstate. For example, you could have a macro state that is high entropy, but someone says, and in five hours, it will be very low entropy. Suddenly, you can mean enormous amount of information about that macro about that microstate just by saying something about the future. There is something you can say about how you can give information based only on presently available macroscopic information and relate the amount of information you get about a system to its entropy, namely the lower entropy, the more the specification of the macrostate gives you. That's something I would certainly agree with. Sigurd Enkhoff says, is it conceivable that the universe could have started in a higher entropy state? If so, how might the early universe have appeared and evolved differently? Uh, it's conceivable. Plenty of things are conceivable. Uh, I mean, it's conceivable that the whole universe uh, is a simulation or that you're a brain in a vat or that we randomly fluctuated into existence. If the early universe had higher entropy than it does now, that means that all of its subsequent evolution into the state that we believe is around us right now was sort of very unlikely and accidental, and therefore all of our extrapolations and beliefs and inferences about the past are completely unreliable. So you really shouldn't believe anything about what you think happened in the past, if that was true, and therefore the only sort of sensible way to go through life is to believe the consistent story that says the early universe did have a low entropy, it's been increasing ever since. I can use my hypothesis that the early universe had a low entropy called the past hypothesis to make inferences about the past based on present data. Martin Ziegler says, in your interview with pro poker player Liv Bury, you discussed playing game theoretic optimal. Have you studied that yourself? And if so, do you recommend that a relative novice study it? If not, can you recommend one or two training tactics that you found to be most helpful for improving your skills? 
Well, so it's important to uh, keep in mind here that nobody knows precisely what game theoretical optimal play is for uh, a, a complicated game like No Limit Texas Hold'em with uh, eight players at the table or something like that. You can solve exactly certain very, very simplified games with two people in them and you know some very prescribed ways of actually betting, but Poker, poker in the real world is too complicated to know what game theoretic optimal play really looks like. You can try to approximate it. You can do your best. Um, but that's just, you know, good poker playing. It's not, not, not really anything special about game theoretic optimal playing. Um, the, the, the way that it does become a special substantive statement is you can distinguish between game theoretic optimal play, which would be sort of a dominant strategy, in the sense that it would not lose to any other strategy, but that might not be the best way to play against a particular opponent. Real opponents in the real world are exploitable because none of them do play in a game theoretical optimal way. So the best way to play in terms of making money is typically not in the game theoretical optimal way because that optimal way does not take advantage of mistakes that other people are, ma are making. If you know that someone is betting too often, you might want to you know, call more of their bets or something like that. So anyway, the, the question about actually playing, I, I think that the kind of math that is helpful to actually playing is pretty easy math. You know, there's hard math involved in proving what is game theoretical optimal, um, but there's easy math in figuring out, well, I have an ace high flush draw, but with two cards to come, they probably have a pair. What is the chance that I'm going to win, right? That's actually very easy math. You just sort of count your outs and compare them to their outs, etc. That's the kind of math you need. Beyond that, the skills involved in playing are less about game theory and more about just uh, taking advantage of your place at the table and what other people are doing and getting a good model of the opponent so you know how likely it is that they are you know betting with different kinds of cards so being a good bayesian and uh figuring out what the other people are actually doing given the information you have about them that's the real trick to playing poker and how to do it some combination of playing reading books talking to other people there's great online discussion boards about poker to read but there's uh, really nothing better than playing there what what is sad I think is that there aren't that many good artificial intelligence poker programs that you can play against uh, one of the best ones I found is called theta poker you can get that for um, your iPad or whatever. I'm not sure what other platforms it's available for. But generally, you know, the AIs are not as good as human beings. The poker programs that you can get are pretty bad, most of them out there. Jaden Hammett says, what are the major contending theories for mass generation of the neutrino? Which is your favorite? I don't really have a favorite. I'm not an expert on uh, mass generation theories for the neutrino. Uh, for those of you who are not experts, you know, the, if you did the simplest possible thing when constructing what we now call the electroweak theory, the electroweak part of the standard model of particle physics, there's no need to have a right-handed neutrino. Um, in the forces of nature that we know about, namely, the, besides gravity, um, the electromagnetism, the weak nuclear force, and the strong nuclear force, a right-handed neutrino would not naturally couple to any of those forces. So you can sort of get rid of it, uh, or at least not put it in, and, and have a consistent theory. But if you don't have that right-handed neutrino, you don't have available to you the conventional way of giving a particle mass, which is to marry a right and left-handed neutrino uh, particle. That's what happens for electrons and quarks and so forth. So you have to be tricky about giving your particles mass. You can have sterile neutrinos uh, that don't have any charges at all, or you can have what are called... Um, Majorana masses that basically use anti-neutrinos as the right-handed neutrinos. So you sort of marry a left-handed neutrino to a right-handed anti-neutrino instead. And there's various tricks you can play. Um, the most common thing to do for neutrino masses are, are what's called the seesaw mechanism, to have heavy neutrinos with a very, very high mass scale. But then they, when they mix together, you get some very, very light neutrinos, which is what we actually observe. It seems like a very plausible setup to me, but we don't have the experimental data yet to know whether it's on the right track. An anonymous questioner says, help, there's a temporal anomaly in my kitchen. Time ticks slower on one side of the room than the other. When I throw a banana across the room, the banana arcs toward the slow side. Everything is drifting toward the slow side of the room. I'm drifting towards the slow side of the room. And when I try to push away, I drift right on back. 
I would like some intuitions for how time anomalies cause acceleration, intuitions that are more physically intuitive than bananas magically move themselves to maximize their proper time. So this is a complicated setup trying to say, you know, if I knew that the metric of space-time, that the curvature of space-time itself was somehow warped in my kitchen, why do I experience that as gravity? Um, I'm going to have the same trouble answering this question that I had to a similar previous question. Uh, there's, there's two levels. One level is why do particles move along geodesics, right? Why do particles work to maximize their proper time? Uh, I mean, I guess there's a previous question, which is, why do geodesics maximize proper time? That's like asking, why is the shortest distance between two points a straight line? And the answer is, you know, that's what geometry tells us. I'm not quite sure what to tell you about that. Then there's a physics question. Why is that the trajectories along which we move? You know, uh, you can derive it from equations of motion, from conservation of energy. But again, that's controversial. Or you can just try to posit it. I think maybe what you're getting at is, is there, there's some intuitive physical connection between a change in the, the so-called rate at which time flows, which again is never a language I would use, but people use it, what can I tell you, versus the apparent force of gravity, the fact that I feel something pulling me or pushing me in one direction. And the best I can do there is sort of analogize, because you're asking for a physical intuitive uh, explanation, Think about the principle of least time in optics. The principle of least time says that when a light beam goes through different media, so air, water, glass, and so forth, it ends up taking the path that minimizes the time it takes to go between one point and another. How does it know how to do that? You know, I talked a little bit about this in the Biggest Ideas in the Universe video on force, energy, and action. Um, it doesn't know, but what happens is the path along which the light beam goes, changes when it moves from one index of refraction to another. And an index of refraction can be thought of as a change in the speed of light in that medium. And you can sort of summarize all that effect by saying the particle, the photon, minimizes the path that it, the, the time along the path that it takes. So in other words, you can trade off this global statement about maximizing proper time in relativity for a local statement that says, I just obey my laws of motion. The laws of motion for a particle is what we call the geodesic equation, uh, which amounts to the same thing as saying that you move on the closest you can to a straight line. Now, if you say, well, I don't have an intuitive feeling for why curved space-time gives me trajectories that are, that are not straight lines, then I don't know what to tell you. You know, at some point, uh, the intuition only goes so far, and you have to accept what the math and the physics are trying to say. Lothian 53 says, if a particle has a wave function that distributes its location evenly over a large area, then I interact with it by causing it to take a position in my world. Does that mean that for every point on the wave function, other worlds also split off and have their own world with the particle found at every possible location? Yes, that is precisely what it means. Up to the ambiguity that we don't know whether there are really an infinite number of such worlds or only a finite number, because we don't know whether Hilbert space is infinite dimensional or finite dimensional. If it's finite dimensional, there's only a finite number of worlds that you're going to get by a process like this. Jan Lushek says, is infinity a useful abstract concept that helps with mathematical concepts only, or is infinity actually a reality in the natural world? Can time, for example, be infinite? So we don't know. I don't know. Nobody else knows either. I see absolutely no reason why infinity couldn't be a reality in the natural world. Um, in fact, every single possible theory of physics that we have actually had success with since the time of Isaac Newton uses the concept of infinity in a very fundamental way, even if it's just saying that space is a continuum, right? If you have quantum mechanics, then the space of all wave functions is a continuum. So there's an infinite number of possible wave functions, even in a finite dimensional Hilbert space, there's still an infinite number of vectors. So I, I don't see any problems with time being infinite or space being infinite, but of course we don't have any evidence that that's absolutely true. So I think it's safer to say we don't know. Raymond Abernethy says, could you explain what quantum error correction entails? Um, I'm not sure how much detail you want here, so I'll try to give you know the very basic idea. Um, there's something called classical error correction, which is probably a good idea to understand first. And this is the idea, let's say you have a string of bits. Let, let, let's say you have one bit, okay? So you have a bit that is either zero or one, and you want to send it to your friend, but you send it over a wire, and there's noise on the wire, and there's always the possibility that the bit just gets flipped. There's some probability that that happens just by accident. So how can you guard against that? 
Classically, what you can do is you can duplicate that bit. If it's a zero or a one, if it's zero, you turn that one zero into five zeros and you send all five. And if it's a one, you turn it into five ones and you send all five of those. And then when the, your receiver gets the message, it is correspondingly less likely that all of the bits have flipped. So you just do some majority count and presume that that was the message that you tried to send. It's never 100% reliable, but you can increase the reliability as much as you want. There's a couple of problems with that quantum mechanically. Uh, one is that it's you can't Xerox quantum mechanical bits. If someone gives you a bit and says, don't measure it, just duplicate it, that is literally impossible to do in quantum mechanics. There's a no cloning theorem that says you can't do that. You can manipulate it in different ways, but you can't just make many, many copies of it and send all of those copies. Uh, the other problem is when you do measure a quantum mechanical bit, you only get to measure it once before it disappears, right? Because you've destroyed it by, by measuring it. You've changed its nature because its wave function has collapsed. So what you end up doing is uh, there's a way of taking one bit and distributing the information, sort of basically what you're doing is you're diluting the bit. You're not Xeroxing it many times, but you're diluting it in, this, in the way that if it's some linear combination of zero and one, you make a linear combination of 0, 0, 0, 0, and 1, 1, 1, 1, okay? So you're distributing that combination over many bits. And then it turns out the clever thing is you can separately ask, you can, you can separately figure out are all the bits that the receiver receives the same or has one of them flipped? Okay, and if they're all receiving the same one, then you presume that, okay, it probably came through okay. And that's a way that you can actually do quantum error correction. You can, you can make sure that it's very unlikely that, you're, that all the bits were being flipped. Now, there is one interesting thing that is worth mentioning here is that that kind of process makes use of a hidden or maybe not so hidden assumption which is that if you have physical bits, like electron spins, qubits, quantum bits, so like electron spins or entanglement between multiple particles or whatever, certain kinds of errors are more likely than other kinds of errors. It is more likely to change one bit at a time by that bit being hit by a cosmic ray or whatever than all the, all the bits changing a little bit, but in concert, okay? So that's what makes quantum error correction possible. I hope that was some help. This is uh, absolutely very central stuff for making practical quantum computers. Suraj Rajan says, I just finished the book and I've been re-listening to the last two chapters. I presume this is something deeply hidden. Uh, last two chapters over and over. There's so much jam-packed in there. I'm still struggling to understand what you mean by degrees of freedom in chapter 14. Is this a stand-in or a euphemism for something more fundamental? Well, it's, it's both a stand-in in terms of language. So a degree of freedom is an abstract kind of notion. It could be anything, right? If you have a single particle moving through space, then it's three different locations in the three dimensions of space are all degrees of freedom. And it's three momenta in the three different directions are degrees of freedom. So we talk about it having six degrees of freedom. A degree of freedom is just something the system can do independently of all its other degrees of freedom, right? So we say a particle has six degrees of freedom because knowing where it is in one dimension of space doesn't tell you where it is in the other two and likewise for the momenta. In quantum mechanics, you have a lot of degrees of freedom that take on the form of qubits, right? Or qtrits if it's three different possible states, etc. So rather than a continuous number like location in space, it is a quantum mechanical qubit, a superposition of zero and one. When we talk about in the emergent space-time game, when we talk about a set of degrees of freedom becoming entangled and giving rise to space-time, um, what we're doing is signaling that we don't know what these bits are, what these qubits or these degrees of freedom are, or at least we're not presuming to know. I think that the safest answer is there isn't anything that they are. They are the fundamental stuff out of which the universe is made. You know, there's some bottom layer and the bottom, you, I, I thought about for the book, you know, inventing a word for this, right? Inventing some nomenclature, but I'm no Murray Gelman. I'm not really as good at this as he was. So, you know, you could call them pixels or uh, atoms of space-time or something like that. But none of those is really quite right because they all evoke um, connotations that I don't want to evoke. I mean, in the real 
correct theory of quantum gravity, we have very strong reason to believe that the world is not made out of localized degrees of freedom, that degrees of freedom are somehow spread out over what you and I would call positions in space. And so it's very tricky to get exactly the right word. So I just call them degrees of freedom because they're the things out of which this emergent space-time is made. Sandro Stuckey says, my question is about when macroscopic, cause, macroscopic objects cause decoherence. How can a quantum system like a photon or an electron remain in a coherent superposition while interacting with a macroscopic object such as a beam splitter or a screen with a double slit, but not when interacting with a measurement apparatus, an observer or an environment? Yeah, I mean, this is a good and important question uh, because, and the answer is, there is a difference between interacting with something and becoming entangled with something. So let's say that you have an, uh, an electron that is in a superposition of spin up and spin down, okay? And you bounce it off of a wall. Don't ask me why electrons bounce, but maybe this one does, okay? The point is, as long as the spin up part of the electron and the spin down part of the electron bounce off the wall in exactly the same way, no entanglement happens. In order for entanglement to happen, it's much more, it's not just that you interact, it's that you interact differently for the different parts of you that have gone into the superposition. So more realistically, an electron with uh, spin up or spin down will fall the same way in a gravitational field. So the electron does not become entangled with the gravitational field by doing that. And so in this idealization, where you do something like the double slit experiment, when you say the electron goes through one slit or not the other, you're assuming that no matter what, the electron can interact with the slit by being absorbed if it hits the somewhere where there's you know something blocking it and going through if it's not, but it interacts with such a way that it doesn't itself become entangled. If it did, if the electron did become entangled with the slits, then you would not see the interference pattern on the other side. George Sharad Bidza says, uh, George had multiple questions, so I picked one. One of the questions was, in your work, Dark Matter with Time-Dependent Mass, that's a paper I wrote a while back, a while back, over 20 years ago, with Greg Anderson, uh, you state that as the universe expands, the density of particles decreases. Does that mean that along with density, the volume of the particles are affected too, and consequently the wave function and clock of the particles? So this is a, a, an idea that Greg and I had a long time back before we discovered the universe was accelerating. This is sort of a, an early complicated theory of dark energy before we knew we, we had evidence that there was dark energy. But imagine that you, know, you have particles, massive particles, which ordinarily we would say something like the following. As space expands and volume goes up, the number of particles stays the same. So the mass density of particles goes down as one over the volume. In other words, if you have a scale factor which tells you the linear size by which space is expanding, the volume goes as a cubed, if a is the scale factor. And so the density goes as a to the minus three. But that's assuming that the mass of each particle and therefore the energy of each particle is constant. We came up with a theory where the mass of each particle increases with time, and it's not just by hand. There's other fields that are interacting with it and giving it a mass and so forth. After all, this is exactly what does happen at the electroweak phase transition in the early universe when the electron goes from having zero mass to the mass it really has, right? Um, so we imagine that happens with dark matter particles in the current universe, and it's consistently ongoing. So all of this was very classical. You know, it's just there's some fields that are coupled to each other. We saw their equations of motion. So you're asking, is the volume of particles affected and the wave function and the clock? None of these things are anything that we talked about. Um, you could talk about them if you wanted to. Uh, the mass of the particles increases, so the Compton wavelength decreases. In quantum mechanics, there's something called the, quant the Compton wavelength, which is shorter for higher mass particles. And this is part of the fact that higher mass is higher energy is shorter distance. Uh, I'm not sure what the clock of the particles really means. You know, an individual particle all by itself isn't a very good clock. It's not doing anything. It's not changing over time. Uh, but definitely the Compton wavelengths of the particles would be decreasing. That is true. Dimitro Shvedtenko says, 
Immanuel Kant famously believed that space and time as we know them are a priori notions in our minds that allow us to perceive the world a posteriori. According to Kant's transcendental idealism, we don't have access to the nature of space and time, and we can't possibly know empirically whether they actually exist. 200 years later, do we have reasons to believe we will get to know what space and time really are? Well, I, you know, my personal belief is that Kant was just totally wrong about this. Um, I mean, Kant very famously, and as we'll talk about briefly in an upcoming podcast, had an idea of the synthetic a priori, that there was something uh, that could be a priori true, but was not true just by the by the uh, consequence of the definitions of the terms in the statement. And so I don't actually agree that there are such things as synthetic a prioris. And I also don't agree separately that there's anything really a priori in our minds about space and time. I think it's a failure of imagination to think that we need space and time to perceive the world. I think that we have space and time and we use them to perceive the world. But I'm open to the possibility that if space and time were very different than what we know them to be, there would still be something that we could imagine calling perceiving the world. So I, and I also think that as, as a, as a matter of how science gets done, you know, this idea of perceiving things as they are is never how science gets done. And by the 20th century, we are very familiar with our work from cosmology and relativity and quantum mechanics and field theory, that our theories that we construct to explain the world are very, very distant from our everyday experiences of the world. And the reason that we're able to construct them is because we go back and forth between theory and experiment and ask what kinds of theoretical predictions match the data, etc. So it's not about, you know, perceiving directly the reality. It's about figuring out the reality by the basis of this back and forth scientific method. And I see no reason whatsoever to think that our scientific method will not succeed at telling us what space and time really are. That's my optimistic take. Peter Gerdes, who goes by True Path, says, I often hear discussions about the arrow of time talking about the need to explain the fact that there was low entropy in the early universe. However, entropy is only defined relative to a choice of macroscopic observables. Has there been any work that tries to consider what fraction of the possible initial conditions would result in a low entropy state relative to some notion of macroscopic observables creatures in, in that world might have? Um, so I'm not exactly sure, once again, what you're, what you're looking for. If, if, if what you're asking is, could, you know, is it, how easy is it or difficult or possible is it to define entropy using a different coarse graining, right, a different choice of macroscopic observables, so that essentially any configuration microscopically of the system could, by that novel coarse graining, count as low entropy? The answer is it's always possible to do that. Absolutely. You can ex post facto, post hoc, come up with some something that to us looks incredibly weird and nevertheless has the feature that what to you and I looks like thermal equilibrium to this weird coarse graining looks like a really low entropy state where entropy then starts to increase. Um, but it's not completely arbitrary how we choose these coarse grainings. Not all coarse grainings are created equal. Um, I think that Carlo Rovelli actually is someone who's worked on uh, an approach like this. And here's why I find it completely unrealistic, because I can look at some box of gas that is in thermal equilibrium from my point of view, and I say, yes, that is high entropy, the gas is all spread out. And someone else says, yes, but in the specific microstate that this box of gas is in, you know, this atom is here, that atom's over there, and here are all the, for every single atom, I'm going to tell you exactly the position and momentum, and then I'm going to coarse grain in a weird way so that makes that particular configuration of position momentum low entropy. That's fine, but it's completely useless. There aren't any observers in principle that observe the thing that way because we know how observations work. Observations work by looking at it, right? There aren't enough photons leaving the atoms in the gas for you to see that very specific macro state that you're talking about. There are actual physical constraints on how we observe things. When you talk about how we decide on what's a macroscopic observable, it's not arbitrary. We use the actual accessible features of physics to make those choices about how to coarse grain into macroscopic observables. So when we say the early universe had low entropy relative to some coarse graining on phase space, it's the right coarse graining on phase space. It's not something we could have chosen otherwise. 
Someone whose handle is sklogw, and who I cleverly uh, did not say sklog, I understand what you're referring to there. It's the formula on Boltzmann's tombstone. In something deeply hidden, among other things, you propose that what we perceive as physical proximity is an emergent phenomenon of entanglement. Experiments have shown that once entangled, particles could be physically separated over large distances and stay entangled. How is it, how is that fact reconciled with the idea that entanglement causes us to perceive physical proximity? So the short answer is the thing that causes the distance in space-time measure, the metric, the emergent space-time itself, is in particular the entanglement between vacuum degrees of freedom, between degrees of freedom that are not particles, okay? The degrees of freedom that all that they're doing is making up empty space. So yes, you can certainly take two particles and entangle them however you want and move them as far away from each other as you want, but it is a fact about quantum field theory that even if you have a very good cutoff on your quantum field theory, so there's not an infinite number of degrees of freedom, it is still true that the overwhelming number of degrees of freedom are just sitting there in their vacuum state. Those are the degrees of freedom that we use to define distance. They have nothing to do with actual particles. By definition, a particle is not in its vacuum state. The vacuum state has no particles in it, okay? So that's the short answer. There is a longer answer that I'm not going to give, but I will mention where to look, to where to read about it. There's something called the ER equals EPR conjecture by Juan Maldacena and Lenny Susskind. And they say that if you have two entangled particles, there secretly is a wormhole between them. So there secretly is a very short distance between them. But as long as they're just two particles, not all the, part all the degrees of freedom around them, that's not going to define what you macroscopically would perceive as the space-time metric. Mikhail Korobko, 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 sorry, uh, says Wojtek Zurek in his existential interpretation of quantum mechanics argues that although the universe as a whole is a quantum wave function, once we select one classical world as our observed branch, there's no reason to treat other branches as equally real. In fact, there is only this branch, and the rest of the universe is simply in the mixed quantum state. Such argument seems to avoid some philosophical problems of many worlds where multiple persons exist in different branches. While I understand that branching is in principle a matter of convenience, why do you treat other branches as equally real? So I think there's a couple reasons. One is, you, you know, the, if, if you want to argue, well, I don't need to treat the rest of the wave function of the universe as real, I would say, why, what is your reason not for treating it as real, right? Like, I don't need to treat uh, the other side of Los Angeles as real. You know, it just exists in my mind. Maybe it becomes real when I go visit, but I don't need to treat it as real. But obviously, it's just way easier to treat it as real. It's just a simpler explanation for what's going on in reality. If I write down a wave function where a priori, there's a bunch of pieces of it and they all look equally real, and then someone puts their finger on one of the terms in the wave function and says, yes, but that's where I live, I don't see why suddenly all the rest of the wave function becomes less important and less real, right? Um, and in fact, the argument about the uh, probability in the Born rule goes the other way. You need multiple persons in other branches to understand where probability comes from. Zurek has a, an argument for probability, but I think he's cheating. Basically, Zurek's argument for probability comes down to the fact that mathematically, the wave function squared is the only sensible thing that you could apply to probability in many worlds. And that's certainly true, but that's kind of obviously trivially true. Everyone's always known that. Everyone always knew that if you got a probability rule out of many worlds, it would be the wave function squared. That's not the surprise. The important question is, why is there anything worthy of the term probability at all? And I think, in my personal view, is that in order to answer that question, you need to take the other worlds seriously, because I think that the probability is a credence you put on the self-locating uncertainty attached to all those different observers and all those different branches. Anders says, William Lane Craig insists that there is an absolute reference frame from God's view. Does this break anything in special and general relativity, or is it just an unnecessary assumption? Uh, I don't think it necessarily uh, breaks anything in special relativity if it has no effect on anything observable, right? Um, so it, 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 
it's much like good old Lorentzian physics. You know, if you were a physicist in the year 1900, you might have believed in Lorentzian mechanics, which was this idea that there was an ether that fixed a rest frame for the universe, but it was just unobservable because of the Lorentz transformations. Uh, if you want to believe that, yeah, I mean, go nuts. It doesn't it doesn't change anything observable about the universe. It just makes your theory more complicated. So as a scientist, I'm not really interested in going down that direction. Dan Inch says, in the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, certain events can cause the universe to split and branch off. Could anything make the worlds rejoin so that their futures are realigned? So yeah, the answer is it's possible for that to happen. It's just incredibly, incredibly unlikely, like many things in the multiverse, in the many worlds of uh, wave function. Uh, it is kind of like cream and coffee spontaneously unmixing in a cup of coffee, but even way, way, way less likely than that. So it's one of these things that is conceivable, but doesn't really keep me up at night. Clive Thompson says, assume two absolutely identical universes spring into existence at exactly the same moment, identical except for one fluke difference. Biology emerges in universe A, some 8 billion light years into the picture, and continues for at least billions of years. Which universe experiences heat death first? Does biology retard or accelerate entropy? Um, I think the biology accelerates the rate at which entropy is increasing. Biology depends on the fact that there is low entropy around, that there is free energy to be taken advantage of, and biology takes advantage of it by converting it into higher entropy energy, by getting rid of the free energy and turning it into waste heat and so forth. So just at a qualitative level, biology would certainly increase the rate of, en of entropy production. Now, realistically, it's a tiny fraction, right? I mean, the sun is doing a way better job at increasing the entropy of the universe than the Earth is, and the black hole at the center of our galaxy is doing a way, way, way better job at increasing the entropy of the universe than all of the stars in the Milky Way. So life does not play a very crucial role in our actual universe, but in principle, it speeds up the approach towards heat death. DJW says, why isn't the second law of thermodynamics considered to be A, if not the solution to the first law, considered here on the scale of the universe, i.e. the big picture? So I'm not sure what to say because I'm not sure exactly what you mean by the phrase the solution to the first law. The first law of thermodynamics says energy is conserved. It does not involve the word entropy in any way. The second law says that entropy only increases or stays constant in closed systems. There's other versions of it, but that's the basic idea. Uh, I think that these are two independent statements. I can imagine worlds in which energy is not conserved, but the second law is still true. I can imagine worlds in which the first law is true, energy is still conserved, but the second law is not true. For example, a world in thermal equilibrium, or a world with just like one simple harmonic oscillator rocking back and forth, where the entropy is just not defined, but energy is still conserved. So I really think that these are separate things that work together to give us the world of thermodynamics that we actually observe. Gary Rancourt says, why is Fermi's beta decay paper regarded as one of the greatest contributions to 20th century physics? Um, I think that there's, I don't know, I'm not sure what the list of the greatest contributions to 20th century physics is. Uh, it wouldn't be in the top three, right? It wasn't the invention of quantum mechanics or general relativity or the expanding universe or something like that. But it's a great paper, a great advance, most obviously because it explains beta decay. Beta decay, for those of you out there who aren't familiar, is just the decay via the weak interactions, uh, and typically a high-energy electron is given off. So a neutron decaying into a proton, electron, and antineutrino is an example of beta decay. A muon can decay into an electron and two neutrinos, same kind of thing. And so that's, I mean, that's an important thing that happens in the world, and Fermi described it correctly, and so that's pretty good right there. Like, when you're the first person to correctly describe a physical thing that happens in fundamental physics, you win. That's an important contribution. There is something else over and above that, which is that Fermi's theory might arguably be the first successful uh, application of quantum field theory to the matter side of the ledger. I mean, you know, if you think about it, we had classical field theory with electromagnetism, and therefore it made perfect sense that when people started trying to understand quantum field theory, they first started with electromagnetism, right, with the forces side of the ledger, uh, the electric field and the magnetic field. And matter was thought of as particles, you know, and, and the fact that you could think of matter as fields 
was less obvious. And one of the reasons why quantum field theory is important for what we think of as particles, what we think of as matter, is because you see particles changing into each other. Um, you see one kind of particle, like a neutron, changing into another one, like a proton. Without field theory, that's very, very difficult to describe. In fact, there's more or less a folk theorem that says if you want special relativity and particles changing their identities, then you need quantum field theory or something like it. And Fermi's beta decay paper was one of the first that used quantum field theory to describe the transformation of one kind of particle into another. Ian Morgan says, well, how about doing a sort of runners and riders thing where you discuss the main theories being put forward for the unification of quantum and classical physics? I'm a little confused about the status of string theory. It's been knocking around for at least 30 years now, and although many physicists are working away like crazy at it, there does not seem to be any prospect of it ever replacing or being added to the existing model. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. That's not that's not really something that uh, is a very exciting thing for me to imagine doing, to be honest. I don't think I have much to add or to say about it. You know, string theory is still, by a very large distance, the leading approach to reconciling quantum mechanics with gravity. I, I think it's so leading that there aren't any other approaches that are a close second, right? There's basically string theory and then a bunch of stragglers. That is not to say string theory is right. Uh, one of the stragglers could be right, or some idea that no one has yet put forward uh, could be right, but it's not really a fair fight in terms of the intellectual attention being paid to these different theories. And there's good reasons for that. You may or may not agree with the reasons, but there are reasons about the fact that string theory seems to predict things very naturally that other theories really struggle to get right. So rather than like rating them at some, um, you know, uh, poll, like, you know, a uh, new poll for the football teams or something like that, college football polls. I would just, you know, like to talk individually about the prospects uh, of the different possibilities. I've thought about my own ideas from, I've talked about my own ideas of emergent space-time from the quantum wave function. We've talked with Carlo Rovelli about loop quantum gravity. We've talked to string theorists. So I think that, you know, there's a temptation to think, you know, something is right. We should figure out what it is right away and work on that. That's just not how science works. You have to keep many balls being juggled in the air until you figure out which is right. And it doesn't bother me that we don't yet know which of the many theories is right. Let them all be studied and hopefully some breakthroughs will happen and we'll make progress. Charlie Morris says, can you give some insight on free will? I am an engineer and I live in a Newtonian clockwork universe. I think the direction that an electron flows is only physics. Could you comment? I agree that the direction of an electron flows is only physics. Um, no one, I don't think anyone should be attributing free will to electrons. Uh, I'm not going to give a long answer here because I've written about this at length. Uh, you can find online my blog post called Free Will is as Real as Baseball. And even better, uh, because I thought about it uh, a lot more since then, you could read my book, The Big Picture, where I talk about free will. Or on the podcast, you could listen to my discussions with Daniel Dennett or Janan Ismail, where we talk about these things in some detail, especially Janan uh, wrote a whole book, um, how, how Physics Makes Us Free. The very, very short answer is that we're not electrons. Uh, an electron is something I can completely describe. I can create it in a state where I know everything it's doing. A person is not. A person is made of a lot of particles, and the best I can do is approximate them in emergent higher level description. And part of that emergent higher level description is, oh, this person makes choices and does things and thinks and has reasons for the choices they make. And just talking that vocabulary automatically puts you in a position where you're talking about free will. Free will is a convenient way of talking about macroscopic human scale actions in the psychological world. Jack Parkin says, during your conversation with Kevin Hand, you guys talked excitedly about Gibbs free energy. Would you be willing to talk a little more about its importance to life? So, yeah, without going into equations, you know, the Gibbs free energy is, uh, comes from the idea that if you have some thermodynamic system, um, let's say you have a box of gas, but rather than all the gas being uh, spread through the box, there's a piston in the box, right? So the gas is being compressed, so it's on half the side of the box, and the other half of the side is just empty. It's just vacuum, okay? So there's a certain amount of energy there, and you can imagine slowly pulling the piston out so that you know no energy is exchanged. We call this an adiabatic transformation. And so that at the end, the piston is extended all the way to the end of the box, and so now the gas is completely full to the everywhere in the box, and now it's at its maximum entropy state. 
So if you did this very, very slowly, you wouldn't actually change the total amount of energy in the box, but you would have increased the entropy inside the box. And before you did that, there was some energy that you could have extracted. You could have, rather than gently pulling the piston out, you could have let the pressure of the gas push the piston. This is actually what happens in your car, unless you own an electric vehicle. Uh, you explode a gas inside a piston, it creates a lot of pressure, and it pushes on the piston, okay? So for a system that is not in thermal equilibrium, a system that is not at its highest energy state, there's a certain amount of energy it has, and there's some subset of that energy which is available to do useful work. That subset of the energy that is useful is the free energy. It's free energy not in the sense that it's freely available, but that it is free to do something. It's more like uh, freedom of speech than free beer, okay? It's free to do useful work like pushing a piston or something like that. So to say that a system has a lot of free energy is to say that it has low entropy. Those are basically the same thing. There's some details once again, but that's basically the same idea. And what that means is the entropy wants to increase, the free energy wants to dissipate and be converted into heat, and that want that teleological or uh, anthropocentric language is a way of making life possible, right? Because life relies on all of this energy to do things. If you're already in thermal equilibrium, you don't have any energy to do anything. You might have a lot of energy, but it's all useless energy. So you can't power thinking and metabolism and all that stuff that is important to life. So a big part of the understanding the origin of life is understanding what free energy there was in the environments of these worlds and why and how chemistry organized itself in such a way to release that free energy via the creation of living organisms. Spencer Hargis says, do you think that many worlds, either in a quantum sense or infinite universe sense, have any implications for understanding of history, for example, the Cuban Missile Crisis? Um, I think no, no, not, not useful uh, implications for, again, the same uh, reasons that I gave before, maybe not completely clearly, but I think that, you know, ha having thought about it, it's not at all obvious, but I think if you think about it carefully, the conclusion you reach is that the way you should treat decisions and history and morality and consequences of your actions in an ever ready and multiverse is exactly the same as how you should treat them in a truly stochastic universe where things happen, but with a probability given by the Born rule. Um, so I don't think that in terms, because you know, your decisions don't create universes. Universes are created by quantum decoherence events, and your decisions might be affected by those, but that's the way the arrow of causality flows. And for the cosmological multiverse, where there's things very, very far away, you know, there's no influence directly on anything you do uh, that's happening over there. So, you know, the fact that the universe is big in one sense or another, and therefore that many things happen, uh, doesn't affect history or morality or ethics in any interesting way, as far as I can tell. Now, it would be different if literally everything happened with an equal probability, right? That would make for a very uh, boring world in some sense. It would be a world where, in some sense, there's no consequence to anything, because literally everything happens, and everything that happens counts equally well, right? But that's not, there's no evidence for that in either quantum mechanics or cosmology. The worlds don't count equally. Some worlds are more likely, some worlds count more than others. And so that matters. So I think that history is more or less history as we think about it. George Faulkner says, the recent New York Times obituary on mathematician John Conway referred to the free will theorem and its connection to the koch specker theorem related to quantum mechanics. As a naturalist, I don't accept contracausal free will and that humans or other creatures have such. So I wonder if you can explain what it is meant by this use here, or if maybe Conway, etc., should have used different terminology that's less loaded with free will baggage. Yeah, so let me be very clear. There is a, a theorem by Conway and uh, Conway and Cochin, was it? Um, that they call the free will theorem, and this theorem has absolutely zero, nothing, bupkis to do with free will in any way at all. It's just good marketing, okay? Can't be more uh, clear about this. Uh, I'm trying to be as clear as I can. Nothing to do with free will. What the theorem has to do with, it's one in a long line of theorems in quantum mechanics about indeterminacy. Uh, much like Bell's theorem and other theorems along those lines, it says given these assumptions that seem to make sense to us, 
certain things are unpredictable, okay? And so for fun or for marketing purposes, they translated certain things are unpredictable into it's like electrons have free will. It's really not at all like electrons have free will. And just to be more clear about that, there is no correlation whatsoever between whether or not the universe is deterministic versus stochastic and whether or not you believe in free will or not. The only implication of the free will theorem has to do with whether you believe the universe is deterministic or stochastic, therefore it has nothing whatsoever to do with free will. You can be determinist and believe in free will or not believe in free will. You can believe the universe is stochastic and believe in free will or not believe in free will. If your interest is in contra-causal free will, then what matters is not whether the laws of physics are deterministic or stochastic. What matters is just that there are laws. And if your interest is in compatibilist free will, then the fact that the laws of physics are deterministic or stochastic, again, doesn't matter the slightest bit. So it just is, is a label that, you know, worked. They, it did its job. You would never have heard of that theorem if they had called it the indeterminism theorem. But it has nothing to do with free will. Fadi Yunus says, considering that the chances of the LHC finding evidence for supersymmetry are now pretty low and the prospects of building a bigger particle collider are slim, what are your present credences for string theory being the theory of everything? And what track do you think physics should follow in pursuit of the theory of everything? So I think it's fair to say that the, well, so it's hard to say uh, that the prospects for finding supersymmetry the LAC are pretty low. Um, it, that might be true, but that depends on your, your priors for various different things. So let me just mention that that's not a completely unproblematic statement. Certainly it's true that the chances of finding supersymmetry LHC are lower now than they were 10 years ago before we turned the LHC on because we could have found it during the last 10 years. So whatever credence you had on theories that uh, have supersymmetry in them should be lower now than they were 10 years ago. That's perfectly fair. By how much lower they should be is the hard question, of course. Now, string theory... Uh, does require supersymmetry for it to work, but string theory doesn't require supersymmetry at the electroweak scale necessarily. Um, the fact that supersymmetry is broken near the electroweak scale and therefore is observable at the LHC was always motivated by things like the hierarchy problem. The mass of the Higgs boson is very different than the Planck scale, etc. Nothing directly to do with string theory whatsoever. Um, Still, like, like I said, string theory relies on supersymmetry, and it could have been there, so it would have been fair had we found supersymmetry the LHC for your prior to go up for string theory, and it's likewise fair for your prior to go down for string theory now that we haven't found it. Um, but by how much is, is going to depend on whether or not you thought it was really likely to begin with, and also what your alternatives to string theory that you're considering in your set of priors really is. So I, I do take seriously the fact that both the LHC has not found uh, new particles and the fact that we've not found weakly interacting massive particles in dark matter detectors either um, as evidence that it's, it's at least plausible that the electroweak scale has far fewer particles than we thought. And that is surprising to me and uh, puzzling because there are puzzles with the electroweak scale, the hierarchy problem and, and related puzzles, the dark matter problem, etc. So I am certainly motivated to look for more dramatic departures from the conventional wisdom, uh, violations of quantum field theory and Lorentz invariance and you know, things like that. So therefore, that is what I am doing. <laughs> but, you know, it's definitely high risk, high gain kind of pursuit, you know. Um, I, I, I can't say this, and I've said this many times, I'll say it again. String theory uh, did not become popular because people said, well, we need to quantize gravity. What's the best way we have of doing it? No one was trying to quantize gravity. People invented string theory to try to understand the strong interactions back in the 1960s and 70s. Gravity came out as a bonus. And then later it was shown that the theory is finite. There's no, none of these infinities that we need to worry about early on. So this is why Ed Witten said that string theory was a, a piece of 21st century physics that fell into the 20th century. We, it's sort of, string theory is much better than what we were trying to do with it. And this is something that, researchers in string theory will tell you over and over again that the theory seems smarter than the theorists. It seems to be giving us surprises that work really nicely. Um, that doesn't mean it's right, you know? It could still be wrong, but the kinds of alternatives that are being pursued, including by myself, 
um, don't yet have that flavor that the theory is smarter than us. The theory is hard. Uh, you know, like, like I said, in my most recent paper with Charles Tao about immersion space time, our strategy was to be very honest and write down a set of assumptions that, uh, give us the answer that we want to get. And you could equally well call our set of assumptions a wish list. These are the things that we hope are true, but haven't yet proven are true. And they're all obstacles. They're all things that until we prove that they're true, we can't be convinced that this is on the right track. And, but again, that's okay. You know, there's no reason to think that quantizing gravity should be easy. Uh, people should try lots of different things. You know, if I, that's my sort of pro-string theory pitch in some sense. My anti-string theory pitch is that I do think that uh, there are there is a segment of the string theory community that has become enamored with doing string theory at the cost of doing physics. In other words, they answer questions that are stated within the paradigm of string theory and lose track of the fact that the ultimate goal is to make contact with experiments. I'm not bothered by the fact that string theory hasn't yet made contact with experiments. It's hard. It's a theory of gravity, and the Planck scale is well beyond the reach of our particle accelerators. But I still think we need to try. If you, if you want to say, well, it's just too hard, then maybe you should work something on something else that is not a theory of quantum gravity, right? If you say, well, it's hard, but I think it's still worth working on this theory, then you really need to keep your eyes on the prize and keep trying to connect it to experiments. Stefan Arlinghaus says, in 1977, the Voyager Golden Record took diverse port trails of diversity of life on Earth and culture to outer space, together with instructions on how the record is supposed to be understood by any life out there lucky enough to pick it up. Imagine the Human Genome Project was already completed back in 1977. I wonder whether it might have been a good idea to put the information on human DNA onto the record, thus sending the possibility to outer space that humans might be reproduced and in some way may live far away in both time and space on alien worlds, slim as the chance of that may be. Um, I don't know. That's a really cool thought experiment, honestly. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I was always skeptical that the golden record on Voyager, even if it was eventually, you know, uh, 15 million years from now, picked up by some super intelligent alien civilization, would have been decodable and understandable at, at anyways. Like, I don't know if I could decode it and understand it, and I'm a human being. Um, but I get the, you know, the, the thought experiment is, should we send out our genome into space? Um, you know, I, I think that I'm in the minority here. I'm on the side of being a little bit careful when it comes to talking to aliens. If there's no aliens out there, no technologically advanced civilizations, it doesn't matter. You know, knock yourself out. So the presumably you're assuming that this will actually be found by aliens. And I think that it's logical to assume that the average technological civilization out there in the Milky Way is of order a billion years more advanced than us. And so we are to them as, I don't know, um, certainly much tinier than a mosquito, maybe like a bacterium to them, right, in terms of advancement. So we're nothing to them. They could destroy us and maybe not even care, not even notice. It's like spraying a can of Lysol to us would be wiping out the earth to them. Maybe, maybe not, okay, we don't know, but it's at least perfectly plausible. So given how young and juvenile and ill formed and ill-prepared we are, I'm not really interested in calling attention to us and especially giving away the secrets of our genome, etc. That's probably not what I would consider to be a good strategy. Better safe than sorry when it comes to talking to the aliens, I will say. Paulina Barron says, is there a question you would like to answer which has never been asked? I would love to hear about it. Ah, so you know, I thought about this. I read this question, Paulina, and I thought about it, and I'm just not going to give you a good answer. You know, the, the real truth here is that between having a blog for many years and tweeting and having a podcast and doing videos and doing Ask Me Anythings and writing books and writing articles and giving talks, I think that there's a much higher number of things that I've said and didn't need to say than there are things that I really wanted to say and haven't had a chance. The things I wanted to say, I have had a chance. Now, the, there's a footnote there. Um, there are things I want to write, uh, books I want to write, papers I want to write that I haven't yet written, that I, that I have thought of the idea for them but haven't yet written. And so those would be what I should tell you uh, as part of the answer, but I don't want to tell you those because I don't, want to, I don't like giving away uh, too much about projects that I'm working on that are still in 
uh, the process of going on because they could change and people say, oh, why did it change? Sometimes they don't even come into existence and people are like, yeah, you wimped out, you didn't finish it. And even if no one is like that except me, I'm still like that. So I don't like to be too public about what I'm working on before it's near completion. Um, the one exception to that is I have signed a contract to write a book, an undergraduate textbook on quantum mechanics. Uh, so that I'm going to do, but other, but that's not an answer to your question. Sorry about that. If I think of a better question that I would like to answer that has never been asked, uh, I'll try to talk about it next time we do an AMA. Alex Jukomenko says, is there a way to have a representation or transformation when potential energy and kinetic energy look the same? And there's more words there if you want to look up uh, the question that Alice asked. Um, Yes and no. This is one of those yes or no questions, depending on how you ask the question. So if you look into the video I did, the biggest ideas in the universe video I did on force, energy, and action, I talk about the Hamiltonian. Did I talk about it in the Hamiltonian? Is that where I talked about it? One of these. I don't know. Space. No, actually, I think I talked about it mostly in the uh, video on space, now that I'm thinking about it. Anyway. I talk about the Hamiltonian uh, formulation of classical mechanics. And the Hamiltonian formulation is one where the way that you get the equations of motion is to find a function called the Hamiltonian. And it's a function of two things, the position and the momentum. Okay, So in ordinary Newtonian mechanics, how you learned it in school, the thing is you have a position that changes with time and you derive from that position changing with time the velocity and the acceleration and so forth by taking derivatives. So it gets built into our brains that velocity is derived from position and momentum is derived from velocity. But in the Hamiltonian way of thinking, you don't. You have to undo that thought. And this is very hard to undo thoughts like that. But you have to think of momentum and position as truly independent things. And then you write down a formula, starting from position and momentum, uh, for what the total energy is. So the simplest thing you can write down for is, is the simple harmonic oscillator, where you have a, a kinetic energy, which is 1 half p squared divided by m, divided by the mass. And you have a potential energy, which is 1 half m x squared, where x is the position, p is the momentum. So those two parts of the energy look the same, or at least they look equivalent, right? Uh, they both, it's p squared for the kinetic energy, x squared for the potential energy. But that's just for that specific example. Once you become more complicated, once you have two harmonic oscillators, or a field, or a non-harmonic oscillator for that matter, then the kinetic energy and potential don't look the same anymore. And that's an interesting question. You know, why do potential energy and kinetic energy look so different? Why it's it's related to the question, which I think to me is, is the fundamental one, why are position and momentum uh, similar but different at the same time? Given that they are similar, why are they different at all? So they are different is the short answer to your question, but it's an interesting thing to wonder why they are so different. Thomas Prunty says, could you recommend the technical reference for decoherence as it relates to many worlds? It's not something you typically see in quantum mechanics textbook or classes. So for the many worlds part of it, uh, David Wallace's book is the classic book, The Emergent Multiverse. It, that's explicitly about the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. And there are very few books that are explicitly about that. So probably that's what you want. But there's also, you know, you can still think about decoherence, whether or not you're committed to many worlds. And for that, there's a wonderful book by Maximilian Schlossauer called Decoherence, blah, blah, blah. I, don't, I forget the subtitle, but it's a technical reference, um, and it's all about decoherence and how it appears in, in many circumstances. You should check that out, Schlossauer. Gerald Droyven says, I wonder if I was a scientist, but I were as, as small as an atom. The question is, could I detect the sun? I do not think I can see it with those bright little eyes. <laughs> so Gerard, I think that you're uh, assuming some things that are hard to uh, consistently assume here. So, I mean, I know what you're asking, what if a person was as tiny as an atom? What if you were Ant-Man and you were in the quantum realm, okay? So I don't wanna disabuse anybody, but Ant-Man is not really realistic. You really can't do that. And it's not just that we don't know or it's hard or whatever. It's really the fundamental laws of nature that get in your way. So the problem is that uh, when you try to make things really, really small in quantum mechanics, 
the wavelength of the thing has to be get smaller and smaller and smaller. And we've already mentioned once in this AMA the concept of the Compton wavelength of a particle. And the thing about the Compton wavelength is, as the Compton wavelength gets smaller, the mass of the particle gets larger. So in the classical world, like where there's people and planets and so forth, these are objects that have Compton wavelengths, but their Compton wavelengths are incredibly tiny. Your Compton wavelength is much, much smaller than an atom, okay? Way smaller. So that's why you look classical. You look like a point. You look like something that's moving with a definite position and velocity through the world. Whereas when you're at the level of individual atoms, uh, the Compton wavelength is the size of the thing. The Compton wavelength of the electron fixes the size of the atom. And the Compton wavelength of the nucleus is smaller, but you'll notice the nucleus is much heavier. So if you try to imagine substructure in an atom, like bright little eyes, well, what is that substructure made out of? It needs to be made out of things that are small compared to the atom. But anything that is small compared to an atom is going to be heavy compared to an atom. So most of the mass of the atom will be in that tiny little thing that you just made. Um, heavy particles like top quarks or Higgs bosons can be very small, but they're also much heavier than atoms, and they decay away very, very quickly. So I'm just trying to you know, take your question at face value as seriously as possible. Um, in the real world, the reason why a thought experiment like this doesn't work is you can't build complicated things that are the size of atoms, but not much, much heavier than atoms. That's the problem. And therefore, um, you're not going to see the sun in the usual way because you won't have the ability to absorb photons with your eyeballs, okay? Most atoms uh, don't absorb photons from the sun in any, in any direct way. Uh, they can be hit by a photon and it can either bounce off or you can either heat up the atom. So the atom stays in its, its ordinary state as a whole, but it's moving left and right, uh, up and down, so it, it gets thermally excited. That's why you get hot on a hot day outside. If the photons from the sun are powerful enough, they can actually change the energy of the electrons in the atom, okay? Um, but none of that has anywhere near the precision and the, the depth of information content to say, oh, look, there's a hot spot in a cold sky, right? That's th that was what would count to me as detecting the sun. And so individual atoms by themselves, I would say, don't have the ability to detect the sun in the way that we usually think about it. Gabor Peter Sayre says, my question is about black holes. We know that general relativity is not applicable at the singularity. I'm aware of the holographic principle according to which the information content is proportional to the surface of the event horizon instead of the volume of a black hole. Could you imagine an experiment or observation that would result in the loss of general relativity's applicability not only at the singularity but at the event horizon of a black hole? So I can certainly imagine that happening. Um, it's harder to imagine detecting it because if you're literally at the event horizon, then there's no coming out, right? That's the point of no return. That's the point that one, once you're there, you're going to go in, you're not going to come back out. Um, but you could say if general relativity was not completely true at the, at the horizon, maybe it's also not completely true 1% further out of the black hole than the horizon, just outside the horizon. In that case, yes, you can imagine observations. What you would want to do is try to figure out what is the curvature of space-time? What is the space-time metric? What is the solution to Einstein's equation near the event horizon of a black hole? Is it the Kerr solution, K-E-R-R, -R, that is what general relativity predicts as the unique solution to a spinning neutral black hole in the real world. Um, that's what we expect most black holes to be. But it's very specific. There's only one answer. Given me the spin, given me the mass, I know what the metric is supposed to be. I know what the space-time is supposed to be doing. So, of course, looking for deviations from the Kerr metric is a very high-priority thing. It's just hard because it's hard to look that close to the, the event horizon of a black hole. We're trying it. I mean, you know that we had the event horizon telescope that took a little picture of a black hole, but the picture was kind of fuzzy. It was a low-resolution picture, let's put it that way. And uh, not yet good enough to actually detect any deviations from general relativity, but that's the kind of thing we're hoping for. Uh, LISA, L-I-S-A, is a proposed gravitational wave satellite in space, satellite in space, of course, um, a gravitational wave observatory in space that would be able to do the following, would be able to track 
medium-sized black holes, you know, the size of the sun, solar mass black holes or 10 solar mass black holes, as they spiral into supermassive black holes, as they spiral into black holes that are a million or a billion times the mass of the sun. And that, unlike the LIGO events, which are very quick and noisy, these events with a black hole spiraling into a supermassive black hole take time and sort of leisurely map out the curvature of space near the event horizon of that supermassive black hole. So that is, you know, probably the combination of most feasible and most accurate map of what's going on near the event horizon that we can imagine in my lifetime anyway. So I'm hoping that happens. I would, you know, I'm not sure what percentage chance I would put on general relativity being right or wrong near the horizon. Certainly the smart money is it's probably right. But if it were a little bit wrong, that could be really, really, really important. Gregory Kuznick says, what is your Bacon number? The Kevin Bacon number is, of course, I'm sure you all know, is the number of linkages between you and Kevin Bacon when a linkage counts as you and somebody else appearing in the same movie. Uh, So it depends on how you count because uh, two things. One, do TV shows count? Actually, three things. One, do TV shows count? Two, do appearances as yourself versus as an actor count, right? Um, So if you count TV shows and you count appearances as yourself, then my bacon number is three. I've been in TV shows with Morgan Freeman, Through the Wormhole with Morgan Freeman, as well as with Stephen Colbert, The Colbert Report. And uh, both Morgan Freeman and Stephen Colbert have been in movies with people who have been in movies with Kevin Bacon. So there you go. My bacon number is three in that sense. If you actually want acting, I haven't done any acting, so I can't really do that. If you want movies, uh, I think it's still three, but I'm not sure. I've never, my face has never appeared in a movie, but my voice appeared in the movie called Earth to Echo. Earth to Echo was a science fiction movie, and they played uh, in the background of one of the scenes a clip of me talking about wormholes and time travel or something like that. So that's where I get my, you know, $1 every six months residual check from the Screen Actors Guild. Very, very uh, lucrative job. Fiat Owner says, when I read Steven Weinberg's The First Three Minutes, how should I think about those three minutes? My understanding is that gravity affects time, so is there something special given the extraordinary conditions that prevailed then? So I kind of answered this before, but the short answer is no. Um, Time dilation is not something that actually happens just because there's a lot of matter around you. It happens because there's a differential gravitational field. Like The gravitational field is different if you're close to a black hole or even on the surface of the Earth than if you are in empty space. But if the whole universe is smoothly pervaded with matter, time just clicks on one second per second like it should. Doug Elthoff says, would a theory of quantum gravity be equivalent to a theory of quantum space-time? You know, I think basically the answer is yes. Um, The only reason I say basically is there's a little bit of a subtlety. Uh, Space-time is a classical notion. Space-time exists as a classical thing in general relativity or even in Newtonian space-time for that matter. So it's not clear that the correct theory of quantum gravity is one that starts with space-time and then quantizes it. So space-time might be an approximation that emerges out of the correct theory of quantum gravity, or it might turn out that space-time is part of the ingredients of a theory of quantum gravity, and we actually don't know which one is correct, because we don't know what the right theory of quantum gravity is as yet. John Brady says, without asking you to do a lot of research, and since the project only officially started on April 14th, just curious as to whether you have any first impressions of the Wolfram Physics Project. So I think I've already given those first impressions above. Um, Like I said, good for him. I don't see, I'm not being given nearly enough evidence to pay close attention to it myself. James Kittick says, I'm fascinated by the idea that according to our current understanding of the expansion of the universe, there will come a time when sentient observers in the merged Milky Way Andromeda galaxy won't be able to see anything in the universe beyond their galaxy, and the CMB will have cooled beyond detectability. Would those observers have any hope of deducing the history of the universe as we understand it today? Um, Any hope? Yeah, I mean, some hope. It'll be much harder, right? Science is always hard. You know, scientists have to work with the data we're given, you know, thinking about the history of life on Earth has this property. Like, so this is not, you know, the the, the idea that, well, someday the local group will have merged into one big galaxy and all the other galaxies have gone, therefore we can't do cosmology anymore, uh, is too strong. Um, We are very interested in knowing how life began here on Earth. That's difficult, 
because the life that first started is not the life that's around today. There is the equivalent of an event horizon between us. But that doesn't mean we don't try. That doesn't mean we don't try to use our brains and our experimental results to try to figure out how life could have evolved and then use that those sets of hypotheses to compare them to how it did evolve and see what the most likely prospects are. So I think that uh, it, the it's better, safer, more realistic to say that as the cosmic microwave background fades and other galaxies go away, cosmology becomes harder and harder. It never becomes impossible. There's never a hard, bright line. We should never think that the way we do things now is the only way that things can get done. Jonas says, special relativity is the formalism that makes the equations describing the world look the same for all observers, moving with constant speed with respect to each other. Is it correct to interpret general relativity the same way, i.e. is the formalism that makes the equations describing the world look the same for all accelerated observers, or is it something more than that assumed, needed to be assumed in, order, in general relativity in order to get gravity? So there's a few things going on here. One is general relativity has nothing to do with acceleration. Okay, there's no reason not to include acceleration in special relativity. Indeed, the most famous thought experiment in special relativity is the twin paradox. And the twin paradox involves a twin that is accelerated in their rocket ship. And that's kind of crucially important. So acceleration and general relativity are completely disjoint questions. You can have accelerated motion or unaccelerated motion in either special relativity or general relativity. The difference between, between general relativity and special relativity is that in special relativity, space-time is fixed and flat and non-dynamical, and there is no gravity. In general relativity, space-time is dynamical. It warps and changes and gets curved in response to matter and energy, and we interpret that change and that warping as, as gravity. So it is certainly not true that the equations describing the world look the same for all accelerated observers. I'm, I'm not even sure what that means. Of course, the equations describing the world can always look the same to all observers. They're the laws of physics, right? Einstein's equation looks the same to all observers. The geodesic equation looks the same to all observers. But unlike uh, inertial observers, there is no equivalence between accelerated observers. You know, I talk about this, and again, I'm going to forget which one, but in one of the uh, biggest ideas in the universe videos, uh, the point of relativity is there is no preferred location in space. There is no preferred velocity through space. There is a preferred acceleration, namely zero. We can tell whether we are accelerated. We cannot tell where we are if we're in a a uh, box that is opaque. We cannot tell how fast we're moving, but we can tell whether we're accelerated. And that is 100% equally true in general relativity or special relativity. What you need to assume in general relativity to get gravity is you need to allow space-time to be curved. That's what you need. TG says, when people refer to time passing more slowly close to a large gravitational mass, I've already talked about that, you know. <laughs> I don't blame you, TG, because everyone talks about it that way. I've tried to explain why I don't like to talk about it that way. How much of that is due to being accelerated through curved space-time versus just being in a just being in a curved space-time? So it's not due to being accelerated through curved space-time at all. So I know what you mean. Um, when you're sitting on the Earth, there's two things going on. One is you're in a gravitational potential well, right? The, it would take you energy to get from the surface of the Earth to infinity, to very far away. And you are not in free fall in that gravitational field. The Earth is preventing you from being in free fall. So you might want to know, um, how would the uh, interval on a clock measure differently if you were in free fall versus if you weren't? Well, and the answer is it's complicated. You know, both effects matter. And the point is you need to sort of tell me what trajectory you're on in free fall versus not in free fall. So in fact, actually, I'll, I'll be very honest about this. I made a boo-boo. I made the one actual, you know, obvious scientific mistake in my very first book, From Eternity to Here, was uh, I got this exactly wrong because I, I talked about the difference between an observer who is just stationary on Earth versus an observer who is in orbit around the Earth one meter above the surface, right? And they're in the same um, gravitational field, uh, but one is moving and one is on a geodesic, 
if you're orbiting, you're on a geodesic, and one is not on a geodesic. But what I didn't take into account was the special relativity effect. Of course, the geodesic is, is, has a velocity, and so you actually have to do the calculation. And it was Don Page, famous physicist, who kindly emailed me and pointed out that I made a boo-boo, so that was got corrected in the updated printings. Um, but, you know, in general, there's no easy answer to these questions. The, the answer is you gotta, there are competing effects. You have to completely specify how you're moving through space-time, and then there's a formula for calculating how much time elapses along your trajectory. And uh, since there are competing effects, you can't simplify it beyond that. Gordon Bamber says, my question is about angular momentum. Spinning stars can collapse into millisecond neutron stars, which are amazing objects, but how about if the collapse continues toward a black hole? Before the singularity is reached, can the spin increase to the point where the equator moves at the speed of light? Um, I think you're going to be able to guess the answer to this question. No, nothing can move at the speed of light or faster than the speed of light if it's not a photon or another massless particle. Now, of course, um, you have to be careful. What do you mean? The speed of light relative to what, right? If you're not moving at the speed of light, then there's always a rest frame in which your velocity is zero. So again, there's sort of the simple answer and the complicated answer. Um, there's an angular momentum that you can possibly have, and there is an upper limit on the angular momentum just from the fact that you begin to fly apart if your angular momentum is too great. But unsurprisingly, if gravity is pulling you together to make a black hole, you never reach that point. Uh, the force of gravity just pulls you in long before you would get there. The interesting thing is that even after you're a black hole, you can still be a spinning black hole. I mean, that's, that's kind of one of these things where it sounds obvious, of course black holes can spin, until you learn a little bit, and you learn that a black hole is not an object, a black hole is a region of space-time. It's a region of space-time with the property that once you go in, you can't come out again. And then you begin to ask questions like, you know, what does it mean for a region of space-time to be spinning? And you can define it, you can define it in terms of, you know, there's a, if you, if you think about the rest frames that are near the surface of a black hole, to an observer far away, they would seem to be orbiting around the black hole. So you can actually define physically what it means, and it all makes perfect sense, and angular momentum is conserved, and everyone's happy. Nothing is moving faster than the speed of light. Maxim Alexandrovich says, according to the many worlds interpretation, every time we choose Diet Coke over regular Coke, the wave function collapses. And since creating a whole perfectly balanced universe costs zero energy, we are responsible for creating a lot of other universes. As far as I understand, moving real consciousness between those worlds would require some new type of force in addition to the four we all know and love, so it's out of the question. But since we created a lot of other well-balanced universes populated with some fake characters, wouldn't they simply carry on as psychological zombies in a world without conscious observers? Um, there's, a, again, a few things going on here. One is, let me say very clearly, you making decisions has nothing to do with branching the wave function of the universe. If anything, it's the other way around. Branching of the wave function of the universe might affect you in such a way that you think about it as a decision being made, but you do not create new universes. In fact, I think that it's a very, very good approximation to imagine that human decision-making is pretty darn classical. And even if you're not sure whether you want the Diet Coke or a regular Coke, that doesn't mean that in 50% of the universes you're going to get one and 50% you're going to get the other. It's probably in 99.999% you get one, and you just didn't know what that one was ahead of time. So it's the laws of physics that make new universes, not new human um, choice making. So, But the other thing is, I think that from the what I read between the lines in your question is the idea that you are attributing somehow less consciousness to the copies of you in other universes than the copies of you in your universe. And I think that that is not correct. I think they are all equally conscious. There are no zombies in any of these worlds. Um, that would be my take on it, because I think the consciousness is a purely physical thing. There's no essence of you that carries on through some single trajectory through the wave function of the universe. There's just more and more people who multiply, and they're all equally conscious. Einars says, does the many worlds interpretation basically say that everything happens and isn't that a bit wasteful? Uh, so no, not everything happens. Some things happen, some things don't. There's an equation. The many worlds interpretation says, look, here's an equation. It's called the Schrodinger equation. It says what happens. Whether it's a bit wasteful is, no, it's not wasteful at all. So the point here, the reason why I can say that with such conviction is, 
The wave function, the quantum mechanical wave function, is a vector in this giant mathematical space called Hilbert space. And in the many worlds interpretation, that vector evolves according to the equation, the Schrodinger equation, and that's all it ever does. If anything is going to be wasteful, it is the fact that Hilbert space is big. <laughs> so there might be many, 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 many components to that wave function. But that's true in every version of quantum mechanics. If you have any version of quantum mechanics that has wave functions and has Hilbert space, the Hilbert space is equally big in all the versions of quantum mechanics. There's nothing bigger about it in many worlds. If you believe that I'm allowed in quantum mechanics to think of an electron being in a superposition of spin up and spin down, there's nothing more wasteful than that to saying that you should believe the universe can be in a superposition of many different states at once. It doesn't cost anything more. And the equation, the Schrodinger equation, says that we get there. It is uh, not wasteful at all. It is the leanest, meanest version of quantum mechanics anyone has yet invented. Paul Cousin says, I'd really like to get some podcast recommendations from you, science or anything else. Uh, so I'm not going to do a good job at this because like popular science books, uh, despite being a producer, I'm not that much of a consumer when it comes to podcasts. The one I always mention that I really like is the Mark Marin show, What uh, WTF. This is, I, I have to, now, nowadays I have to um, classify my podcast episodes as explicit or clean. So you can imagine what the words WTF stand for, but um, the, the Patreon, etc. want to know how I'm actually classifying these. So let's keep this one clean since it's otherwise clean. WTF by Mark Marin is very, very funny. It's basically, roughly speaking, celebrity interviews, right? But Mark Marin is a, a comic and a writer and an actor himself, and he's just really very good interviewer. He gets people to say things that they don't otherwise say, to tell good stories, uh, to tell some jokes, and, and to get be lighthearted. You know, I don't want to listen to physics podcasts for the obvious reasons that I've already mentioned. There are good physics podcasts out there. Um, there aren't, you know, there's still really plenty of room for a really good podcast that does nothing but talk about a big physics story every week, right? Like my podcast doesn't do that. Um, maybe there are podcasts out there that try to do that, but that I'm just not that familiar with. There are plenty of physics podcasts, but that, that sort of, um, you know, look, when I do a podcast, since this is not my day job, I do it because it's what I think is interesting. Um, it's, it's not like a, my primary goal is not to provide a service. I like to think that I am providing a service, and I think that that is a goal, but it's not my primary goal. I'm not that selfless. <laughs> I need to keep myself interested, right? Um, whereas if I were to provide a service, you know, maybe it would be useful to do a like physics story of the week podcast. And uh, I don't do that. And I'm not even sure that there's a great one that does it. If there is, then, you know, please leave it in the comments. Because, again, I'm not, I'm not that familiar with the podcasting space. Um, but there are a lot of good interview-type podcasts, like what I do. Um, uh, Cara Santa Maria has the Talk Nerdy to Me podcast that I've appeared on. Ali Ward has uh, Ologies podcast, where she talks to a different ologist every week. So paleontologist, anthropologist, and so forth. Uh, Stephen Strogatz at Quanta has just started a uh, uh, podcast where he talks to mathematicians and scientists and things like that. So there's a bunch out there. Um, and again, I'm, I, I, I'm, I almost hesitate to say to give any more recommendations because I'm sure I'm missing a lot of really, really good ones. You know, I like uh, in the non-physics realm, I like hardcore history is another one that I really, really enjoy. Things like that. Things that are taking my brain very far away uh, from physics. Jeremy Labrec says, if a photon of wavelength X is traveling and encounters a photon of the same phase, it results in constructive interference. If that photon meets the same photon half a wavelength further, it will be out of phase, it will result in destructive interference. I thought that photons don't experience time because they travel at the speed of light, but we get two different outcomes when it encounters the same photon in two different positions. What has changed about the photon in that period so that we get two different outcomes when interfering with the same photon? Um, so one thing I have to say first is that 
you're, you're speaking a language that kind of mixes up photons, which are particles, with waves of light, which have wavelengths and constructively or destructively interfere. Of course, these two things are closely related to each other, but it's the quantum mechanical wave that is really there. The photon is the particle that we observe in our detector. So it's better to speak, I think, a wave-like language here. Now, this idea that photons don't experience time, you know, that is a common language translation of a technical fact. The technical fact is the proper time along a null trajectory, a speed of light moving trajectory through space time is zero, okay? That's the fact, the proper time is zero. Photons don't experience anything, but you know what? Neither do electrons or protons. They're elementary particles, or at least the electron is, as far as we know. The, the proton has some, some substructure, but it's still in a unique quantum state. It's not experiencing anything at all. The amount of proper time along the trajectory for an electron is a positive number, whereas it is zero for a photon. Um, but that, is, that mathematical statement doesn't mean that time doesn't happen. The photon moves through space, and we, who are not photons, can still talk about the photon at different moments of time. So when you say you get two different outcomes when two photons encounter each other at different positions, well, that happens at different times from our point of view. Once you're talking about more than one photon, you can't be in the ref... If it, let's put it this way. When you're talking about two photons that are going to hit each other, okay, you can talk about what is seen in the reference frame of one photon or the other, but not both at the same time if you're going to be moving at the speed of light. You can pick the center of mass frame, in which case they're both moving. Um, so in some sense, there is a change that happens to the photon when it encounters another photon, but at that moment of change, it is no longer moving quite at the speed of light. When, po when photons interact with other things, they're no longer moving at the same speed. That's why photons move more slowly through glass or water or air. So then time does happen even to the photons. John Jack says, as a grad student that works on theoretical fluid dynamics, I have always been a bit jealous of the attention fundamental physics gets with the public. I've seen a lot of people that consider the theory of turbulence and other theoretical problems of fluid dynamics as a practical problem or a problem to be left to the engineers and modelers. Why do you think this is the case? So I would, you know, my recommendation is easy for me to say, so you're, you're welcome to ignore my recommendation. Don't worry about how much attention your field gets with the public. Worry about how the work is going, right? I mean, you should worry about funding. That, that's important. If, if anything, if you think that there are aspects of your field, I, I say your field because I'm not specifically speaking of theoretical fluid dynamics. I mean, any field out there. No one ever thinks that their field gets enough attention. So this is almost universally true. If you think that's true, if you think that the public is missing something because there's all sorts of really cool things about your field that they could know, but they're not getting because the ecosystem is not giving it to them, then give it to them. Then you're saying that there's a huge opportunity. There's a huge market out there for interesting things about your field to be shared widely, and no one's doing it. So do it, right? If that's that's the and you should take that those lemons and turn them into lemonade would be my advice. Um, but my even bigger advice is not care. You know, people think that certain questions are interesting or less interesting. That's an that is a subjective thing. It's not like the coarse graining on phase space that we use to define entropy. That is extremely relative to the individual interests and knowledge of the person. Okay, and that is going to change as that person becomes more and more educated in a field. It is perfectly understandable that individual questions within some field will have different levels of interest to people in the field and people outside the field. Once you learn more about it, once you learn more fluid dynamics, you realize, oh, there are all these really important questions that are fascinating and fundamental, and I like them, and I say, good for you, right? If you can somehow get that across to a wider audience, then that would be great, but I wouldn't worry about it. You know, I think, again, it's an opportunity if you care about reaching those people. And if that's not your personal goal, which is perfectly fine, then, you know, do other things. Uh, you know, worry about getting the work done. That would, be, that would be my advice. Bryce Graham says, I'm trying to understand the following quote by Hermann Weil. The objective world simply is, it does not happen. Only to the gaze of my consciousness crawling upward along the lifeline of my body does a section of this world come to life as a fleeting image in space which continuously changes in time. I've heard the block 
universe model of time described as a music record. Just as the past, present, and future are real, the entire song exists on the record. However, we only experience a single instant at a, of time at a time, just as the needle on a record only plays a single note of the song. In this analogy, what could be considered our needle with respect to the block universe? So, yeah. This, I, I like both of these analogies. I think that Vile gets it a little bit more accurately here than the needle analogy because the, there is no needle, right? That's the part of the analogy that isn't working. And this is just going to be a problem with analogies, that analogies are never perfect. The analogy of the record is the point that there's a difference between what is real, which is the whole song on the whole track of the record, and what you are experiencing at any one moment in time. So at any one moment, you say, okay, pick out a slice of the universe, one moment in time. On that slice of the universe, there is a you, right? There is one moment of your existence. And what is now with respect to, so sorry, to ask it correctly, what is it that is experiencing that moment of time as now? That part of you, that moment of you is experiencing the rest of the moment of the universe as now. There is no needle, though. There's nothing outside the universe that is pointing to that moment and calling it special. That's the whole point of being an eternalist or a block universe person, is that all of these things are real. So the question of what is now is always relative to what is going on. Every individual moment in your life experiences a different now, and that's fine. I think that's fine. Like I, I think I have a bad—I think I'm not very good at explaining this, because honestly, I don't— see the problem very much. I, I, it seems pretty clear to me. So I think that therefore I'm, I'm missing some uh, disconnect between how I think about this and how presentists think about it. We need to get a presentist on the podcast to really argue this out. Frank Cockrit says, should further studies lead to, the over, to overcoming the initial skepticism from a new study using analyzed data from the Chandra X-ray Observatory, observing a quasar at approximately 1 billion years from the Big Bang and suggesting that the cosmological constant appears to have changed during a subsequent 12.8 billion year expansion while accompanied by large-scale anisotropy, might that alter your thinking one way or the other with regard to eternal inflation theory? So I think I mentioned the anisotropy claim before. Now I'm worried that I talked about anisotropy when the question didn't a ask about it because I was thinking about this uh, question ahead of time. If I did that, sorry, it's been too long now. Too much of my proper time has elapsed since I answered that question. Anyway, uh, I put very, very low credence on this anisotropy claim in cosmology. We have the microwave background. It's, it's isotropic. It would be very, very hard to imagine anything else. Um, now, there are observations that can change your credences with respect to inflation. The eternalness of inflation is not really very relevant here. Um, I think that the experimental question is whether inflation happened in our past light cone or not. Eternal inflation is about whether inflation is still going on elsewhere, which is not really an experimental question. Um, so I, I can imagine that there would be uh, observations, but these particular observations that you're talking about, again, I just don't think that they're very credible. So we are trying right now to do observations with respect to potential gravitational waves signatures in the microwave background, also with respect to what are called non-Gaussianities, which are a way of thinking about correlations between different fluctuations at different length scales in the microwave background. Uh, so far, everything is very vanilla and boring, so we don't really say anything one way or the other about inflation, but we're definitely trying. There definitely could be um, different kinds of things. And, you know, I'm responsible for some of them. You know, some of the papers I've written made predictions for, for example, large-scale anisotropy. So when I say that I don't believe the claim about large-scale anisotropy, that is speaking against my own interests since I have predicted large-scale anisotropy. But I, I predict that it should show up in the CMB, not in galaxies first. Trip Dennison says, uh, recently I started reading Ian Banks's culture series because you often bring it up in discussions about futuristic or conjectural sociology, economics, AI. I was expecting a cerebral philosophical story, but have been surprised by how brutally violent the first novel is. Do you have opinions about violence in fiction and media? Um, I have opinions, but I don't think my opinions are especially clever or profound. I think that violence is fine, and I think that it can be overused. You know, I think that 
um, I think about violence uh, about the same way I think about jump scares in horror movies or sappy music in romantic movies. They can be substitutes for real good storytelling, uh, but they can also play a crucially important role in good storytelling. So again, I don't think it's a very clever or deep way of thinking about it, but I think it's true. Um, violence plays a role. And so I, you know, I, I don't mind the violence in Banks's novels. Uh, sometimes it gets pretty extreme. You know, he has written non-science fiction novels. Uh, he wrote a famous book called The Wasp Factory, which is kind of truly horrifically violent. <laughs> and it's not for everybody. I don't actually recommend it. I used to recommend it because I really, really liked it. And then I found that people were, began to look at me funny because they're like, you like that? <laughs> That's kind of horrible. Um, but then again, there's other examples, like in a lot of Quentin Tarantino movies. I mean, I mean, Tarantino is a brilliant director in many ways. And I think that, you know, he has violence that he uses in weird ways, like to get laughs and things like that, which I kind of don't like. I think that violence um, can be perfectly appropriate, but it should be appreciated for the horrible thing that it is. Antonio Justino says, I would appreciate some help better understanding the fundamental qualities of space and inflation or expansion, which have always confused me. Space expansion accelerates between the galaxies, but not within one galaxy. Is that because gravity keeps the actual space fabric from expanding, or because gravity keeps the particles in relative distance together while the fabric still expands? Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, I, I think that I have to hesitate here because I'm not sure there's a difference between these two options. So what the way that we think about it in general relativity is there is space, okay, and you can put some coordinates on space. And once you put those coordinates on space, you can use those coordinates to talk about what we call the metric. And the metric is a way of converting coordinates into physical distances. If you draw a path, through your coordinates, you can use the metric to figure out the length of that path, either the length in space or the length in time. Likewise, you can figure out areas and volumes and things like that, okay? So it doesn't matter at all what coordinates you use, right? So I can use coordinates on space-time in which the universe is not expanding at all, or I can use the coordinates in which, so I can use it coordinates in which the universe is not expanding, but objects are shrinking right? It's the same difference. It doesn't really matter. So you have to, and, th and this, and I don't want to um, act like this is easy or trivial. You have to shift your intuition a little bit when you go from Newtonian absolute space to general relativity. You have to figure out that there are some questions that have sensible answers and some questions that don't. So the questions with sensible answers are, what is the physical distance at some particular moment in time between two objects? Or how long would it take to zip a beam of light from one object to another and bounce it back? And so the question about, you know, if, if the universe is expanding in between the galaxies but not within the galaxy, that's a poetic way of, again, translating into English a very specific claim about the metric on space-time. And the point is, the metric within a galaxy to a very good approximation is static. It's not that different than the metric within the solar system, okay? There's no need to talk about expansion at all. But if I throw a particle away at greater than the escape velocity of the galaxy, the distance between me and that particle is growing with time. That's just true, right? Uh, if, so think of it this way. If I were in special relativity, there's no gravity, no expansion of the universe. I could imagine a configuration of particles which I started with them all moving away from each other, right? So that would look in that world just like space was expanding. And if you, if you wanted to ask, but is space really expanding because all the particles are moving away from each other? My advice would be not to ask that question. You know, at, wonder about questions that have physical answers. So the distances that you can measure on specific trajectories or the times it takes that will be measured by clocks on specific trajectories or the redshift that you see a photon undergo given what its rest frame frequency was. Those kinds of things have physical answers. So there is an intuition according to which space is static near a galaxy, it's expanding in between the galaxies, but what really matters is what you observe along trajectories. 
George Robinson says, I'm not sure that, sorry, uh, Antonio, I'm not sure that was a completely satisfying answer. It's, it's the best I can do. I've struggled with this question for a long time. George Robinson says, the many worlds version of quantum mechanics explains away some of the mystery of measurement, but what does it say about the mystery of entanglement? Given an entangled system, we can calculate the outcome of an experiment, but what can we say about the nature of entanglement? So I think that you have to, these are not the same thing. There's no, there's no such thing as the mystery of entanglement. Entanglement exists. It's perfectly well described. We know everything about it. It's surprising to us if we start from a classical intuition, but that doesn't mean it's a mystery. Like we've figured it out. Entanglement is not mysterious. We talk about the measurement problem in quantum mechanics, not because it's weird or surprising, but because we don't agree on what is happening. A many worlds person says the measurement process is one in which a small quantum system in superposition becomes entangled with the environment. A uh, Copenhagen person says the wave function collapses when something makes a measurement. So they don't agree. They're saying different things. That's the mystery. There's nothing to say about the mystery of entanglement except, look, things are entangled. That's what many worlds has to say. Oria Biddle says, do you know what we're to expect to see in fall of 2021 when we first start getting images back from the James Webb Space Telescope? I'm very excited for this. Um, I'm not really, this is not my expertise, so I'm probably not the right person to ask. Uh, the thing about the Webb Telescope is that it is an infrared telescope. So unlike the Hubble Space Telescope that was visible light, where we're sort of taking the same kinds of pictures, just at much better resolution than we take here on Earth, with Webb, we'll be looking at a different set of wavelengths. And the reason why that's an interesting thing to do is, of course, because things in the early universe, not the super early universe, not like one second after the Big Bang, but things at the early stages of star formation and galaxy formation, their light has been redshifted from when they were formed to today. So the thing that we're most excited about, I think, generally, with the James Webb Telescope is the ability to look at very, very old stars and galaxies to get a, an idea of what was happening in uh, the earliest moments when galaxies and stars first started existing, when they started forming. Uh, more specifics than that, you will have to look up online. That's, that's my general amateur's uh, knowledge. Tony Ciaffardoni says, if we were given power to magically solve or answer any one, if I was, if me, I, Sean, were given power to magically solve or answer any one open problem or question in physics that currently defies our understanding knowledge, which one would it be and why? Um, I don't know. Am I allowed to say what is the correct theory of everything? Because <laughs> if I'm allowed to say that, then I will choose that. Uh, I think that's pretty, that's a pretty good one. It's not the only one. Like even, it wouldn't be the final answer to every question. You know, you still don't know things like uh, how complexity evolves in the universe and stuff like that. So just knowing the theory of everything isn't good enough. But if I only had one question to ask, it would be that. If that counts as too grandiose, then something like, you know, yeah, how do we reconcile quantum mechanics with gravity? That would be a really good one. I would like to know that. Okay, the final question of the AMA is from Paul Hess, who says, in your Katie Mack interview, you said that you don't believe there will be quantum fluctuations in the far future because there would not be an observer measuring the quantum state of the universe. Why is an observer necessary to affect whether or not there are fluctuations? For an example, wouldn't a Boltzmann brain observe itself? So you have to be careful. I'm not saying there are no fluctuations. I'm saying there are no dynamical fluctuations. In other words, the quantum state doesn't change from one state to another one. The phrase quantum fluctuations is not very well defined. In uh, the papers I wrote with Kim Boddy and Jason Pollock, we actually went through at least three different things you might mean by the phrase quantum fluctuations. Dynamical Boltzmann fluctuations, observer-induced fluctuations when you measure a quantum mechanical system, or radiative corrections, differences between classical expectations and quantum mechanical expectations. So what we mean is, since there are no observers, there are no measurement-induced fluctuations in the, early, in, the, in the late universe. And also, the wave function of the universe settles into a static state. So there are no dynamical random fluctuations either. The state is static. That's what it means, that there are no fluctuations. There are still radiative corrections, which are just a different way. That's just a very bad use of the word quantum fluctuations. So a, a Boltzmann brain observing itself no, I mean, Boltzmann brains don't come into existence in the late universe because there are no random fluctuations going on. So um, it's, the, it's, not the, it's true that there are no observers, but that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is the wave function is static. The wave function is not changing with time. So literally nothing is happening in the very, very late universe. 
at least according to me and Jason and Kim. That's what we think, and we've tried to present the case. Some people agree with us. Some people don't. It's one of those, one of those situations that I personally uh, come across surprisingly frequently in my research where half the people are like, this is so obviously true, why are you bothering wasting my time? And the other half are like, this is so obviously false, you've gone completely crazy. So that's where I like to live, at that boundary between obviously true and obviously false. Someday I will achieve uh, that special place to live where you go, wow, that is not obvious, but it seems to be true. That's what we should all shoot for. All right, stay safe, be healthy out there, and talk to you later. Bye-bye.